So welcome everybody. We are waiting a few minutes before starting and the webinar will start soon. Welcome everybody. We are still waiting uh, one minute before starting so people can join us. But we, okay, I think that we can start to our webinar. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm Alberto Martinelli. I'm the representative of a user organization committee of SRF for the structure of material subtopic. As you know, the user organization promoted this series of webinars aiming to explore the capability of the SRF beam lines. And the organization of this webinar series is supported by the Streamline, a European project funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of participating in the webinar held by Andy Fitch that will present the ED22 high resolution powder diffraction beam line. Andy studied chemistry at the University of Oxford and did his doctorate in the Department of Inorganic Chemistry using powder neutral diffraction with Brian Fender, that was a previous director of the ELL, of the Institute of Lowell Angevin. At the time, the head of the department was John Goodenough, who was awarded by Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2019. Andy spent five years at the ELL as postdoc and scientist before taking a lectureship of uh, six years in physical and inorganic ch chemistry at Keele University in the UK, where he was a joint appointment with the UK's synchrotron radiation source the Raspberry Laboratory. So he was closely involved with the development of a powder diffraction program at the Raspberry. Then he returned to Grenoble in 1992 to build the BM16 power diffraction beam line and its successor, and ED22 is uh, the last one of his power diffraction beam lines. He's currently scientist in charge at uh, the ED22 beam line and his activity is focused on powder crystallography, particularly with regard to studying molecular system and their phase transition. So after brief, uh, this brief presentation of Andy, I remember to everybody that there will be some time for your question at the end of the webinar. You can write them in the answer and question window that you can find, uh, I think, uh, uh, if your Zoom version is like mine, uh, in the lower uh, field of, of, of a screen. And then uh, your uh, question uh, will be uh, forwarded to Andy by me. So uh, please, Andy, you can start uh, your presentation. Okay. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everybody. Do, does that work? Can you see that? Is that a full screen? No. Yes, perfectly. It's okay, is it? Okay. So, well, thank you, Al Alberto, for, for that introduction. Um, yes, I'm going to talk to you about um, ID22, the high-resolution powder diffraction beamline. Um, and uh, as Alberto said, this series of webinars is supported by the European Streamline Programme. So when we come to synchrotron radiation and powder diffraction, there's some, some general observations. <clears throat> the, the high intensity, the 
stringent collimation and the wavelength tunability of synchrotron radiation means you can build powder diffraction facilities that far outperform laboratory instrumentation. You can build instruments with very high angular resolution, and this is particularly pertinent to ID22, or you can have machines with very rapid data collection with excellent statistical quality. Synchrotron radiation is highly monochromatic, so the peak shapes you measure are very well defined. They're nice symmetric shapes sometimes. There's no problems of alpha one, alpha two doublets you get in the laboratory. And the wavelength is tunable, so you can go to absorption edges or measure well away. And you can optimize the radiation for the experiment. And at ESRF, we have access to high energies, so you can increase your Q range. And this is particularly relevant for measuring PD, PDF, pair distribution function analysis of uh, crystalline materials, which are less than perfect. Or you can penetrate through sample environments, complex arrangements um, that might otherwise um, uh, be more difficult to do. So we've had a high resolution powder diffraction beamline at ESRF. Um, for many years, the first beamline was built on bending magnet BM16, and it entered user service in May 1996. And it was there for six years when we upgraded and we moved it to ID31 to exploit the greatly increased flux. And it was there until December 13, December 2013, and then part of phase one of the ESRF uh, upgrade, and we moved to ID22. And uh, well, we've been there ever since. And during the uh, the EBS upgrade, we've made a number of improvements to the beamline. Um, and this is what I understand this this webinar is supposed to introduce you to. Um, so we've replaced the storage ring. That means we've got a brighter source. And at ID22, we see a roughly twofold increase yeah. in the flux of photons arriving at the sample. We took advantage at the same time to change the, the undulators, and we've replaced what we had with a 2.5 meter long in vacuum uh, U26 undulator. And this has given us an additional twofold increase in flux at hard energies above, above say, 50, 60 keV. We've upgraded our multi analyzer stage. I'll come back to multi analyzer stage and explain what I mean from nine crystals to 13. And we've replaced our detector with this beautiful Iger pixel detector, which we put behind the multi analyzer stage. And as a result of that, we can do something we were never able to do before. We will uh, correct the data we measure for the axial divergence of the beam, which means we're getting now narrower and more symmetric peaks, and we can get improved statistical quality at high angles. And along with the rest of the ESRF, we replaced the beamline control system from SPEC to, to BLISS. Um, <clears throat> talking about multi-analyzer stages, because this is the heart of one of the key components that makes uh, ID22 a high, uh, a high resolution powder powder diffractometer. This was something that was conceived uh, right at the beginning from BM16 by Jean Riudou, Michel Anne, Pierre Baudet, and Alain Pratt at the local CNRS, Institut Neel. And it means you put nine crystals in parallel with scintillation counters behind them. And to uh, be detected, the radiation scattered from the sample has to fulfill the Bragg condition on a on a crystal before it can go into the detector. Putting nine together gives you nine times the counting efficiency. So if you'd come to, to ID22 um, just over two years ago, three years ago, this is what you would have seen. We had a, a nine crystal multi-analyzer stage and a bank of nine scintillation counters. In January 2021, we took delivery of this uh, IGA a cadmium telluride detector, which we replaced behind the analyzer stage. And this receives the signals diffracted from the analyzer stage. And then in July 2021, 
we increase the number of crystals from nine to 30, and this gives us a greater counting efficiency. So if you come to the instrument these days, this is what you'll see, 13 analyzer crystals and this, this 2D cadmium telluride <coughs> Iger detector. Um, sample is typically a capillary sitting on this uh, high-speed spinner. So samples are nearly always uh, small, Lindemann capillary tubes filled with a powdered sample. We can take other forms of, of sample as I'll, as I'll show where it spins at high speed. And this is back to the analyzer stage. As I said, to be detected in the detector, the radiation scattered from the sample has to be Bragg reflected from one of these crystals uh, into the, anal into the uh, detector. And this whole assembly is scanned around so analyzer crystals are really the heart of the uh, the whole of the high resolution of, of ID22 because an analyzer crystal, um, because you have to fulfill the Bragg condition on it, it stringently defines a true two theta angle. When you use a position sensitive detector or you scan a, a slit, then your diffraction angle is essentially inferred from the position of that slit in space or the position of the pixel on the PSD. But with a, an analyzer crystal, you actually define a true angle, which means that you get very, very high uh, discrimination of the angle of the traveling photon. So you get the narrow, in fact, sample limited, limited by the quality of the sample peaks with accurate positions. You also remove a number of aberrations from the whole experiment. If you are misaligned with the sample, or you have specimen transparency, or your sample is a funny shape, or surface effects, this has absolutely no effect on the position of the peaks, which means that they're very, very accurate. Similarly, peak widths, if you're working in a reflection geometry, are not affected by uh, uh, any kind of theta two theta para focusing condition. And the uh, analyzer crystal was also suppress fluorescence and Compton scattering and parasitic scatter. They really mean that you can measure very, very accurate data. The only downside is that you have to scan them. So they take a lot more time to record a pattern than if you have a position sensitive detector. And this is just at the bottom to try and illustrate that if your ideal diffractometer axis is at this point, the path of the beam into the detector follows the green line. If for some reason you misplaced your spinner, to get into the detector, you still have to fulfill exactly the same Bragg condition on the analyzer crystal, which removes a whole raft of these uh, displacement type aberrations. Peaks are in the right place. So just to remind you what a powder pattern looks like in reality, the beam hits the sample and is diffracted into a series of Debye shear cones. And to measure the diffraction, the intensity, we scan the analyzer crystal through these cones, and when it fulfills the Bragg condition, as it touches the cone, it reflects into the detector. So this is looking at in more detail. Of course, being a cone, X-rays are scattered in the vertical plane, but also off to the side. You can imagine this kind of azimuthal angle uh, phi, which is some measure of the axial, the horizontal divergence of the diffracted beam. And the angle at which it satisfies the Bragg condition on the analyzer crystal varies with this, um, this angle, with the degree to which it's uh, actually diverting from the diffraction plane. And you can see this and measure it with our 2D detector. If we look in the middle of the detector, we see the like the Bragg reflection of being at one particular detector angle. But as we go further around the cone and likewise measure further out towards the edges of the detector, that two theta angle gets smaller. And this gives rise to the well-known effect, which is seen in all forms of powder diffraction of the uh, asymmetry at low peak angle. And you can imagine it, uh, if I'm looking down the diffraction cones and I'm scanning a slit, 
through the Dubai Shira cones to get a, a nice powder diffraction pattern. Um, the, because of the width of the slit, it picks up the intensity of the cone early at a lower diffraction angle. And that this early diffraction gives rise to this low angle asymmetry. Now, when you have a 2D detector, like an Eiger detector behind your uh, analyzer crystals, <clears throat> you can actually look at the position your photon arrives on the detector in the horizontal sense, and then back correct to what the true two theta angle was that it was diffracted into the cone. And we do this absolutely systematically now on all data measured on our multi-analyzer stage. It took a bit of while to set up, but to the user, you don't even know this is happening. This is completely behind the scenes, automatic, and has been set up by our, our com computing support groups. So what this does is now we have improved peak shapes, which are more symmetric. The peak widths are narrower, so we've got better angular resolution than we had before. And as you go to higher angles and the curvature of the cones become less, you can actually use more and more and more of the axial width of our detector. So by the time you're getting to high angles, you can use the full 38 millimeters width of the cone of, of the of the detector, which means that we're actually also improving the statistical quality of the data at the same time. And this is just a peak to show you. This is the silicon 111 peak of a silicon standard. Uh, you can see that at down at six degrees, it's got a full width half maximum of about 2.3 milli degrees. Uh, just to illustrate with a real sample, one that a user might bring, the effect this has had, shown here in red, okay, this is the part of the powder diffraction pattern of a zeolite ZSM5, shown here in red is what you would measure without this uh, axial correction, and shown here in blue is what we get now. You can see quite a dramatic improvement in peak shape and peak width. And similarly, as we go to higher angle, the red is what we would have measured if we uh, uh, used the old system without correction and maintaining a constant uh, axial acceptance. And offset by a thousand in blue is the data we, we measure now. And I can think you can see the statistical quality of that is, is considerably improved. And if you take uh, you know, a peak shape standard, which is the NIST LAB6 sample, you can see the, the kind of stunning powder diffraction patterns we can measure these days. <clears throat> we can measure here up to 90 degrees. This is at 35 keV, 0.354 angstrom's wavelength. And you can see you can measure very high resolution data to very high angles of really quite uh, excellent quality. And if you look at the widths of those peaks, you can see how our resolution function varies slightly more than two milli degrees down at low angles, rising up to about 20 milli degrees at 90 degrees. <clears throat> and I showed you for ZSM5, the, the dramatic effect this can have. Here's just another example. This is a protein sample, which was measured on ID22. It comes from Irene Margiulaki's group in Patras in Greece, it's insulin. And this is the low angle, okay, there, it's a very large unit cell. So peaks are at low diffraction angles. This is what we used to measure. Um, this, it's a very, very high quality powder diffraction pattern, um, well-resolved peaks. Um, but now when we apply these corrections, this is what we get. This is exactly the same data just reprocessed to take account of the axial divergence. So that's now what we measure on ID22. And if you look at a bit more of the powder diffraction pattern, you can see the high quality from this protein data of this protein uh, data set. And if you want to take that data set, so the way you and try and work out the unit cell, so to work out the unit cell from a powder diffraction pattern, you measure the position of 20 or so peaks, if you do that and put that into your favorite indexing program, whatever that is, this is the Topaz suite that I use, and you see if you can index it, it does index it, and it's a large orthorhombic cell with a volume of 3 million cubic angstroms, and this just indexes without any trouble at all. 
So from these sort of high quality data, you can index cells of 3 million cubic angstroms volume. We don't just do high resolution on ID22. We have a complementary large 2D medical imaging detector. It's a Perkin Elmer device, and we use this for complementary measurements. Uh, we bring it up close to the sample position. We move the multi analyzer stage out of the way. And then we can measure uh, device Shira rings at hard energy, 60, 70, 75 keV. And this is very useful for pair distribution function analysis. Um, we can measure diagonally across the detector to a Q in the range 25 or 30, which is usually perfectly adequate for pair distribution function applications. So the particular attributes of ID22 is can be summarized really. We have very high two theta resolution. We have a broad energy range. We can met work in the range six to 75 keV. That's going to quite significantly hard energies. For standard samples, if you come with your sample, the chances are we'll be working at something like 35 keV because this is very convenient for capillaries. You can penetrate through absorbing samples um, and it gives you quite a high degree of versatility in sample environments. As I said already, we correct automatically for this axial divergence. We have quite significant intensity and we have this complementary 2D detector for, for example, a distribution function analysis or texture analysis or, or for whatever it seems appropriate. So just to look more at the sample, samples are typically capillaries mounted on a spinner, or if you come with a piece of metal that you want to study strain in or surface diffraction from, we have X, Y, Z stages where you can, can mount the sample. I hope this isn't going to make everyone seasick the next, uh, the next thing, but this is, this is showing a typical sample spinning away on the, uh, on the sample spinner on the diffractometer. My, my hand wasn't very steady when I was, was filming this. Okay, but we're not restricted to capillaries. This is showing a, you know, just a, a normal pharmaceutical formulation, a tablet that you might swallow, um, where people were interested in looking at the, uh, uh, the different compositions within it. And you can also oscillate samples as well, should you should you wish to. Um, when you have very nasty grainy samples, we take all sorts of samples on ID22. It's sometimes convenient to spin them about two axes to try and get a better powder average. And this shows our Gandolfi spinner spinning away um, about a slower axis and a very, very fast axis. Mm. Of course, with powder diffraction, you're very often working with some sort of sample environment. Um, most of our experiments are doing something to the sample, heating it up, cooling it down, absorbing gas on it. And we have a very wide range of sample environments on ID22. We can work basically in the range 4K to 1600 C as standard via various cooling devices, uh, a cryostream blower, a liquid helium cooled cryostat, hot air blower, furnaces, and we have a gas absorption cell and a robotic sample changer. And they're all integrated into the control system. So you can program a whole series of measurements and uh, leave the machine to get on with it. So this is just a glance at some of our sample environments. Here's our hot air blower. Here's our cryo stream. Over here, we see the induction furnace, which we borrow from the sample environment pool. There's our liquid helium cryostat, and this is our gas cell um, mounted on the oscillating spinner, capillary little gas cell, gas supply <coughs> for absorbing gas on samples, desorbing gas from samples. A lot of interest, people studying metal organic frameworks to do this. And if you are a user who uh, has a van load of equipment that you wish to install at the beamline, we can do that as well. This shows a an experimental setup where the users came from Newcastle in the UK with their in situ catalytic um, fixed bed reactor system. And we could mount this on the defractometer and measure 
what was going on inside the uh, the beds as the catalytic reaction went on. Uh, we also have a robotic sample changer. Um, we can mount up to 75 uh, samples for this to be used. Yes, here's a quick view of them mounted, uh, ready to be run on the instrument. They're mainly capillaries, but we're not forced to, to run capillaries on this. Here are some, some pharmaceuticals, some tablets, all set up, ready to go. And just a quick glance at uh, the robot in action. Okay, I, I hope you noted there that the uh, the cryostream was in action. The robot is compatible with both the cryostream and the hot air blower, which means that with a robotic sample changing, we can work from 80K to about 950C, and this can all be programmed. So what sort of experiments do people perform on ID22? Well, anything which will fit on, really. Mainly structural studies, crystal structures and pair distribution function analysis but also a lot of studies where the sample is evolving, heating it up, cooling it down, changing the atmosphere, putting batteries in the beam, looking at solid state chemistry, um, electrochemistry, watching phase changes. Because we have a wide energy range, we can tune to absorption edges in a very wide range of elements for carrying out anomalous scattering studies to help distinguish neighboring elements in the periodic table. You've seen our robot, we can do high throughput, we can put 75 samples on and, and run through them. And also because of the high quality of the data, we're very good for quantitative phase analysis, maybe very complex mixtures with many phases, or maybe just very small trace phases. Peak shapes are dominated by the sample microstructure, so from looking at the details uh, analysis, from a detailed analysis of peak shapes, we can tell information about microstructural properties. And we can also uh, map residual strain in, in various components. In fact, anything you can fit on the instrument, we can, we can study. It's very, very flexible. And this has applications in a wide range of scientific areas, material science, physics, structural chemistry, cultural heritage, Environment, energy, industry, geosciences, we, we, are, we are very, very polyvalent. So I must be running out of time fairly soon. Just a couple of examples, just to show you sort of thing typically people might do. This is a, a crystallographic study of an anti-Parkinson disease drug called Razagilin mesitolate, which we did with uh, Graciela Diaz Delgado, who came to visit us uh, last year for a period. Um, this is a, a well-recognized drug. This is its chemical uh, structure, but its crystal structure isn't known. And various people have studied it in the lab. This is, this is Graciela's data from the lab. And this is various other um, diffraction patterns you can find in the literature and in the patents. And um, well, when you look at what you get on ID22, you can see there's there's quite a difference in the, the quality of the pattern if you compare what you get on ID22 to what had been measured previously, you can see a dramatic change in, the, in quality. And of course, from data like this, it's relatively straightforward to solve the crystal structure. And then if you're a chemical crystallographer, you can study the molecular packing, the hydrogen bonding, what, what holds this crystal structure together. Another thing we're, we're, we're good at is looking at rather subtle changes in uh, structural properties. This is a study of a couple of tetragonal tungsten bronzes done by our former post doc, uh, Ole Grenvel. 
um, where he was looking at, in this barium sodium niobium oxide, looking at the phase transition at high temperature, it's tetragonal. And as you cool down, you can see it splits into an orthorhombic phase. And there'd been a lot of debate as to what was the nature of the very low temperature phase. Uh, did it return to being tetragonal? And it's quite clear from our ID22 data that the peak splitting persists and it remains orthorhombic right down to the lowest temperatures that we can measure. A related compound, um, strontium barium niobium oxide, has dis disorder over the strontium barium sites. Um, it was the question was, was the distribution ordered or was it to some extent disordered? And by tuning to the barium absorption edge at 37.5 keV, you can see very, very subtle changes in the diffraction pattern at low angle. If you look at this, this is away from the edge. This is at the edge. You can see there's a change in the intensities of, of those two peaks. And this gives you a handle on being able to deduce, deduce the, the barium strontium distribution. And just uh, <clears throat> a final example. Um, this was done by Giorgio Confalonieri, who was another postdoc until until recently. Um, there are a lot of worries about sunscreen and their environmental impacts, uh, uh, you know, on, on marine environment. And um, an idea is to try and encapsulate them in some kind of matrix like a zeolite. And she studied the absorption of this sunscreen molecule in zeolite L. And uh, well, from the data, not only was it possible to locate the uh, the location of the molecules within the, the zeolite. Um, this was coupled with some, some uh, theoretical calculations, but also you could show that the crystal structure went from hexagonal without any absorbed molecule down to a monoclinic structure. Um, the subtleties and the peak shape and the uh, accuracy of the intensities conclusively proved that there was actually quite a significant change lowering of symmetry um, when you absorb this molecule. So this gave you a lot of interesting structural information about this. So I think I've probably run out of time. Um, so I have to thank, well, everybody who's contributed to ID22. We wrote last year a paper in the Journal of Synchrotron Radiation describing the current status of the beam line. So everybody who contributed to that and also the current team, um, that's Catherine Dujois, who is uh, the scientist on, on ID22, Ezio Cavacci, the uh, technician, and we have two new postdocs who, who recently joined the team. And uh, thank you to you for your attention. Thank you, Andy, uh, for a very, very nice presentation. Uh, before starting with the discussion, I remember to everybody that this presentation has been recorded and will be made available on the SRF web page to dedicated to this webinar uh, series. And in this web page, you can also find previous uh, webinars.